welcome to the eighth and final episode of the build along series where we are going to build an entire game from scratch with no steps skipped and that game is the keeper's lair or i've been calling it lately tkl for short and let's get into it there is so much to cover i don't even know where to begin sometimes but i'm just going to start with the storyboard and I'm going to start with things that apply to all levels and then we'll go level by level and explore the, the changes and some of the feedback that I got from playtesting. First things first, in all levels, I increased the radius of the flashlight from uh, 50 to 60. And that was from feedback from multiple playtesters that said that it was kind of making them sick or giving them headaches because it was too narrow and making them focus too much. So play around with that. If you want, increase it to 70. I didn't get the same feedback when I increased it a little bit. In fact, they didn't seem to even notice. So I think that was really just made all the difference. I updated the battery drain to 0 0.03. Previously it was 0 0.01 and that seemed too generous and again you know this is one of those things that i am too close to the project to know how fast or slow that is because i can just walk through these mazes from memory and and it doesn't take me very long at all there's no challenge to me uh, at all so i needed that new player perspective and even with that it was clear that the battery life was too generous 0.03 brings the battery length without any pickups to roughly three minutes or a little less. It's going to vary to some degree uh, depending on the player's computer because each computer has internal clocks and those internal clocks are going to run slightly differently depending on the processor speed and so on. And so it's a, you know, it's a ballpark, roughly three minutes, give or take. Um, but I think that's Still pretty generous, especially because there's plenty of battery uh, pickups. I did, in fact, uh, reduce the number of batteries throughout all the levels because it was just too too generous. I also made all of the battery pickups worth 25 uh, regen, and that is because I wanted it to be consistent. Um, initially, I wasn't consistent with the way I was placing those batteries uh, down and, and configuring them. And then I went through all levels and made sure that they were all consistent. I added lots more rats in all levels. All levels have more rats because the rats were fun and they were fun to watch. And they added a little life to the levels and I thought they were uh, needed. I added the ability to save your game. So previously, the idea was that if you died, I wanted you to be able to restart at like a checkpoint and uh, and pick up where you left off. But what I discovered was that uh, in the stable build, at least, that is not possible. You, you die and, it, and it's game over. Now, I put in a bug report with Lee and Lee worked on that. And uh, last I saw it was fixed, but needed confirmation. So I will go back and do some testing and make sure that that's working so that when uh, stable gets updated then we'll we'll have the concept or the ability to have lives right so you'll be able to adjust how many lives you could have three lives or five lives and then there's even a behavior that necrom is working on which will be applied to an object and picked up or uh, collected enough of those so like think mario right you collect 100 coins and you get a, a, a free man right that's the the idea so lots to come in that space all stemming from this game and this series and the in the bug report that i put in so you know it, it pays to you know observe and report bugs because they can be fixed and they can be improved and that benefits everybody i added uh the load screen and the and the save screen now so you can save your game you can load it back in that's all uh, built in here so you can see those two screens here on the loading screens, each one of these, I've added a different uh, message at the bottom, a little clue or help tip. Uh, this one's just the standard one to let the player know how to access controls and understand the controls. So that's just the first loading screen. But then as you get into uh, the game, and you start playing, you know, I tell them, hey, you can save your game in the options menu. They may not know that uh, previously and then you know here i give them a clue 
to think twice about using a battery. You might need that later if you can find it again. Uh, so that helps players not gobble up batteries immediately as soon as they see them because it's 25 recharge, right? So if you've only used 10% of your battery, you're just wasting 15% and they may not understand that intuitively. Um, be mindful of your surroundings. Some objects can be picked up and even thrown. That was being lost uh, by playtesters when they were playtesting. They were skipping right over the bricks, jumping over the pits, not really understanding that those things could be picked up. And that's my fault for just assuming they would. So I uh, worked with Necrom on that, and you can see that the behavior has been improved, and you'll be able to add an image that appears. So it replaces that tiny little plus sign with an image that is a lot more noticeable. Plus, with the text and the loading screen tip, I think that'll be a little bit better. And then here, just a reminder to save your game. Because here they're at the last level, so it would be tragic if they were to not save their game and have to go through the entire maze over again. So I'm just trying to help them out as much as I can. Uh, added music to all of the levels and uh, the loading screens and so on. So big shout out to Mr. Quentin. He did an amazing job making custom music for this game, uh, which was just spectacular and i couldn't thank him enough it's you know i couldn't do it myself i could probably find some music but it just wouldn't be the same it wouldn't be built for this game and that really makes all the difference a huge shout out to him just a real quick reminder uh, when you're in a screen like this one then you can add a music track here um, and what I did was I got two music tracks from him. And so I varied it up. Uh, the levels all have the same music track. The screens have those tracks. And then I have a different track for the title screen, the win game screen, and the game over screen, which is new as well. We'll talk about that next. And all of those screens have a place where you can add sort of like a, a, a music track to it. But I wanted it to be distinct and different as you're moving around uh, the different screens so that it, it didn't just, it didn't just be one monotonous sound the entire time, you know? Um, I also lowered that sound volume because I discovered a, a bug and we'll get into reportable bugs here, uh, towards the end. But what I just real quick, since it's related to sound in this screen, uh, no, not the screen, my apologies in the sound setting screen this slider doesn't do a damn thing so um i don't know why but it doesn't it just doesn't work at least in the stable build that i was using so um i'll have to report that maybe it's already been fixed and it just hasn't been released yet i don't know but i'll report it nonetheless and hopefully that gets fixed but in the meantime what i did from feedback is went and reduced the volume of the music so that it would just be a little bit softer. I tried not to, you know, do that too much because I didn't want to. I didn't want you to just miss it entirely, but uh, I needed to be just a little bit quieter, just so it didn't, you know, drive the player nuts since they have no control over it. Speaking of the music, I did doctor one of those tracks, uh, and that had to do with the end screen because there's a laugh sound that I'm using in the game where you, when you encounter the keeper he laughs and, and basically just walks away and i uh, use that on the game over screen so you die somehow and the music starts and then you hear him laugh at you which i just thought was a nice touch See, there's pipes that were added to the switches and so let me show you what i mean this is a good segue to get into the tutorial level this is the pipe that I'm talking about. So, and this is the kind of switch. So if you look really closely, it has this kind of like extension coming out of it, but there was no pipes sitting there uh, underneath most of them. Uh, mostly because I was just slapping them on the wall and wiring them up. Uh, so I went through and just tidied that up and, and that started the kind of journey of tidying things up. So before I get into all the details of that, I want to make sure it's clear and, and explain. This is really more my own process or methodology for development. It can vary. Everybody's different. But for me, I like to take kind of a layered approach where I'll do sort of a 
wireframe first, just to kind of get a feel for it, see if it's something that I, I like and that it seems like it's going to be viable. And then I'll layer in some more details, more functionality, play test a little bit, and just kind of go layer by layer until it's right. And so during the videos that I recorded up until this point, I wasn't really too concerned about getting it just right. And I think I've even said that a couple of times before. I was really just trying to get it in and then I can go in there and refine it and perfect it. And that's really what this video is all about. Little details like that are the things that I kind of perfect at the end. That's just my style. Your style might be different. You might want to make it all right as you go. That's up to you. But that's what this video is about is refinement. And it's really, in my view, it's maybe the most important video of the entire series because there is so much, not only to cover, but to learn from this experience, you know, and even though I've been using the software for maybe two years, I've learned quite a bit about you know, the experience of using the software on a larger scale. I mean, it's one thing to make videos that are for, uh, to maybe take me an hour or two to put together, you know, and, uh, and, you know, then I throw the, the scene away and I never use it again. It's an entirely different experience to make something tangible and real that somebody's going to play and, and enjoy, hopefully. Here you might notice that I've added a zone directly underneath the player start marker. This zone as a behavior called message. And I actually have not done a video on message yet. There's a whole list of videos that I haven't done yet. Um, but so let's just go through this together since I haven't actually covered it. So this zone has to be triggered in some way. You can't just start, it's not like a text zone where you can just start underneath the player and it'll just work. It has to be triggered. So what I did was I wired it up to the button so that the message would appear when the player starts journeying outside of this room and it gives the player uh, an understanding of the game concept because they may not have watched these videos and they may not understand the concept or what I'm going for here. Uh, so it says you've been kidnapped by the keeper, pick up the flashlight, try to escape the labyrinth. Uh, but be careful. The path is laden with deadly traps and devious puzzles to survive. You must keep your wits and escape each level before the battery runs out. That's it. That's the game, right? That's the whole game concept. So that was important because one of the play testers that uh, provided me video and provided me a play test was not part of our community, at least not prior to this experience. He actually was a friend of a friend and uh, started talking about what the project and what I was doing. And he was interested and he offered to play tests. And so I thought that was incredibly helpful. And, um, uh, as a result, since he didn't understand the game, it revealed to me, Oh, I need to be a lot more explicit about what this game, you know, this game is about and what you gotta do. So that's where this message came from. So you can, you have a lot of customization options here. You have five lines, lines of text, which don't come out all at once. I'll show you here in a second, how it looks, but, uh, it just kind of, types it out a little by little. Uh, and then you have the coordinates where it's going to show up on the screen. Uh, you have the size of the text. I just went with three because I didn't want it to be like huge. Uh, and then the style, you can center it or you can put it to the left. I put it to the left, obviously. The number of lines shown, uh, it just tells you how many lines does it need to show. So if you're only using two, just set that to two. And you have the letter delay. Now this time element is a little funky and it took me some time to dial it in and get it just right. I didn't want it to go too fast, but I also didn't want it to go too slow and just be a drag. And so I just kind of had to feel my way through it. It's really difficult to tell you what uh, is better or worse because it's going to depend on how many lines of dialogue you're using and what your game is all about. But the initial, like if you use this, the initial placeholder text is like a message briefing. Um, so kind of play around with that and then t tweak it to your liking. Then you have the display time, uh, which is how long is each line going to be displayed uh, before it just disappears. And then uh, lock player. So if you want the player to sit there and read all of this uh, and not move until they've read it all, then you want to check that box. I felt that was not necessary, so I left it unchecked. I also didn't need any sound, so I didn't put any sound in there. Okay, so a little bonus video for you on the message behavior. Uh, 
Uh, so that's there, and that gets triggered. Let me show you what that looks like. I'm just going to play it. You should be able to see it. You can hear the music. And we're going to turn on the switch. Remember, it's all black in that area, so you can really see it really kind of pops on the black background. But see how it's kind of coming out ever so slowly. It's you know, easy to read, um, and you can continue to move on. You can keep moving around and just have that up in the, the top of the screen, and eventually it'll just pop out. So that's what that's for. Um, also added a text here. Now, this is just a text zone. So as soon as the player walks into it, then they're going to get a little message just reminding them, hey, you got to escape before the battery runs out. So adding a little, little pressure, a little urgency to um, the start of the game. Speaking of clues, I added some clues. <laughs> so uh, it was very obvious from watching the play testers play that they did not understand what to do on this level and one of them even died because his battery just ran out he just couldn't piece it together so that's that's not a good tutorial that's a bad tutorial right if you can't figure out what to do from the tutorial level then the tutorial failed um, so I'll take that. I accept that and I improved upon that. So now there is a note here on the wall that says small, small cracks and slight gaps are evident in this wall as if it hides a secret passage. So pretty much spelling it out for him. Hey, there's a secret passage here. Now that alone was not enough to help the player understand what to do because when they got to this junction here, the message was available regardless of which direction they were facing. And so that became confusing. And by the time they got around these two corners and pressed this button over here, and they would go left, they would go right, they'd go all the different directions. They just didn't know where to go back, even though the message was in this junction, right? In this, uh, in this intersection. It just didn't occur to them to come back to the spot. So what I did instead was I added a decal here and that decal has the behavior of glue entity and glue entity is uh, something that we've covered before. I'll leave a link in to the video here and uh, the behavior name is what it's glued to. So the behavior we're using is door sliding. When you have a, uh, Behave, uh, a behavior that you're going to that has a space, use an underscore here, um, and that'll cover that. And then don't forget to link it, right? So this has to be logic linked, the decal has to be logic linked to the door, so it's kind of stuck to it. Um, and that way, there's a visual clue and there's the text clue. They miss it after that, I don't know what to tell you, right? Like, it's pretty obvious. Um, but that's it, that's really the entire tutorial level um, that, uh, we have to the only other thing i did and this is really all levels um is added these little audio sounds for a rat that squeaks um and that's just for ambiance you know you're walking around and you see some rat comes flying out and you hear the squeak and it's just you know adds a little life to the level now let's get into level one the so level one is the same size as the tutorial in terms of footprint uh, there wasn't a whole lot to level one in terms of functionality. You really just have the one puzzle, which is, you know, push a button, open the door, and then you're out. This level is arguably easier than the tutorial to figure out. Even with the extra clues, it just seems like people had no trouble accomplishing this, which is okay. It's the first level, you know, it wasn't meant to be hard. Uh, so that's all right. But what I've done here is I've added one challenge. All right, so there is a pit here. Now the player has some agency. The player could choose to just jump over this pit. It's not hard to make this jump. So that is possible. Or they might find this little button over here. And if they find that button and they click on it, then what will happen is this will slide into place and cover the gap and then there's no risk. So it's up to them, you know, giving a player agency is important. Uh, because, you know, they might choose it to, you know, they might say, well, it's, it's, it's going to take longer to go find out and solve this problem. I'm just going to jump over. I'm going to take the risk of missing this jump and dying uh, versus taking the time to go explore. So that's up to the player to decide. Uh, but if they choose to do that, then they can find a little bonus battery back here. But that's really the only thing back in that area. 
uh, they don't really need it because if they go this direction, they pretty much can't miss how to get out, right? Uh, now this is this brings us to our first problem area, the first thing that we ran into, and I'll show you some video here where the players were triggering the switch early and it was confusing them. And in one case, switch somehow got tra uh, triggered and then triggered a second time, which closed the door. So the player didn't know this the player didn't understand this. You know, the player, this is their first playthrough and they're already trapped. They're, the level is so bugged, they can't complete it and they don't know this. And they wander around for the longest time because remember the battery drain was much slower then. And they end up dying, which is no fun. That's no fun at all. The game's supposed to be fun. So that's my bad. That is something that we'll talk about when we get to the end of the video, lessons learned. And that is the you know the one of the lessons that I learned about the experience. So what I did was to solve that was simply remove the weight trap here and replace it with a simple button. Um, and that will help alleviate it. You click the button, opens the door. And now it's pretty simple to, to get out. There's really no way you can get lost back here. So uh, very simple level to cover. Let's move on to level two. All right. So this level is, there's a lot more to it. And it's one of my favorite levels, honestly. It's when when I think about the level design, the, it's this one and the next one that are my two favorite levels. And if I had it to do over again, I would probably do away with the last level that we just looked at and re redesign that all together just because I think it could be so much better. Um, but you know, I'm happy with it. I'm not going to go through all that effort. It is what it is, but this kind of talks to another lesson learned that I'll get into later about game design and planning and so on, but I don't want to bore you with that right now. I'll bore, with, bore you with it later. Uh, so let's get into the changes to this level. So the first thing I did was I added a text clue right here. This wall gets broken when all four of the switch count switches get switched, if that makes sense. Um, so that's the idea. You come, if you were to turn right, I'm sorry, if you were to turn left from here, you would end up in a, a dead end. And if there was nothing telling the player that they would ever need to come back here, right? So they would have just discounted that all together as that's a dead end and they would never have come back. And so what I did was a couple of things. I added a text uh, zone here to let them know that this the wall has signs of recent repairs. You can see I've added some debris on either side of the wall, really more for just effect. Now, the way I did this was I took this object right here and really just replaced its textures with the textures from the wall itself to make it match. And so then I get the same object with a different texture becomes a new, new object. Um, and I thought it looks really nice. Um, the, when you break that wall, you hear it from wherever it is you're in the maze. Um, if you went this way previously, then you'll have had a text clue and that will probably hopefully trigger a memory to say, Hey, uh, I remember there was something fishy about that wall. I'm going to go investigate it. You know, now that I've heard this sound, that's the idea. Not always going to work that way. Sometimes players will just not remember or never go this direction to begin with. And so that's up, you know, it's up to them. It's the, the, uh, the chance of it all, right? We just don't know how the player is going to, going to act or explore. Uh, the other thing I did was I made sure that this text, uh, area gets destroyed when the wall gets destroyed. And I did that just by adding another destroy object behavior here to the hint text, which is what that's labeled. Um, and that way it gets destroyed at the same time. That way they're not walking through this area, maybe even for the first time. And all of a sudden there's a text hint. They're like, what wall are they talking about and why, you know, so that goes away if they destroy the wall, uh, sliders, let's talk about sliders. Uh, you remember these sliders, they had a very distinct sound uh, initially. See, all these little plates are moving and that was too much. It was just too loud, too obnoxious. You could hear it from anywhere you were in the maze and it drove one poor play tester absolutely mad. 
So I fixed that. Uh, first thing I did was I replaced the sound itself. So instead of it being that metal tick, that really loud metal tick, instead it's this sound. You can barely hear that, but when you hear it in concert with all the others, then it's more noticeable, but not so noticeable that it's like irritating. That was really important feedback. Um, and I also reduced it, right? So there are, I think, 10 panels here um, and uh, nine, ten, 9 or 10 panels here, and they didn't all need the sound. So every other one has the sound, I think, or something like that. I reduced it on a number of these so that um, it wasn't playing for, for every thing that was moving. It just didn't need to. So just be aware of that. Not only is that a memory save for your game, it's going to make it just a little bit more per, uh, performant, uh, but also it's just less irritating. You just don't need that. But that was really good feedback from Extreme Strategy. Then there's the, what I've dubbed the trick or treat area. So initially the idea was that there'd be two buttons here and the player needs to choose one of those, which would open one of these two walls and they would either get a trick or a treat. So if they walk into this one, then an explosion happens, they get damaged. They walk into this one, they get a battery. Um, the problem was, is that I didn't make it such that you could only choose one. So one play tester was clever and he uh, opened one of the panels up and he got the battery and then he opened the other panel up and got an explosion in his face. So that was not intended. So uh, what I've done here is I've added a swap behavior. So there's basically another one of these buttons just overlapping. You can kind of see it. It's just Z fighting right there. Uh, so it's right behind it and it's hidden at start and it gets activated if the other button is clicked. And then the button that you see here that is a switch gets deactivated. So it gets swapped out. Um, and that way you can only press once. If I press this one, that one becomes inert. And if I press this one, that one becomes inert. But you only get one of these. So it's trick or treat. And that kind of led me to make a little custom decal here. Now I did a video on how to make decals. So I'm not going to go into all of that, but this was pretty easy. I just found a font I like that kind of looked like handwriting. Followed the procedure that I cover in that video, which I will link right here. And made myself a custom decal. And I just thought that would be funny. So trick or treat, they understand now that they have a choice to make and they're either going to get a trick or a treat. Uh, more rat zone sounds, more rats all throughout. And then finally updated this part here. If you, if you play back that video, you'll see that I didn't raise the ceiling at the end. And so when the play test, when the play testers got to this area, it was just obvious that the ceiling was too low. So I just raised that up and made it look nicer. Um, but that was all that was needed for this level. So this is level three, what I call level three, what most people call level four, and that's because they call the tutorial level one. So the first thing that I'll point out is that I, sw I swapped out a couple of the buttons because in this level, if you'll recall, there are switch counts, just like in a previous level, but there are also other buttons. And so what was happening was they weren't distinguishing between switch count buttons and other buttons that might do something else. And they were clicking a switch count. They were getting say one of three, then they might click this other button and it's not a switch count. So it doesn't say two of three. And they were like, this is bugged. What's happening, right? They, they, there wasn't a distinction. So I replaced this button. So it was clear, this is something different. And that leads, leads to a secret. So. Um, they would open this door here, basically by pressing this button, they would come through here and then here's a same button. This button has a secret, uh, attached to it. Now, this is another behavior. I actually haven't technically covered in a separate video. So let's just get, uh, cover it here. I'll do a separate video as well, but just for my audience here, I'll, I'll cover it separately. So we have the secret behavior, which is triggered. So it's on the wall that the button is, is, uh, sitting on and it's a logic linked, of course, and you just put in the prompt text. So my prompt text says a secret has been revealed somewhere. Not going to tell them where it's in there. At least they know what happened. Uh, you can affect a user global. So if you've made a global of some kind and you want to affect that global in some way, then you can do that. 
so for instance, let's suppose we had a global called secrets and we wanted to increment it by one when they found the secret, we could do something like that. And then of course, a, a sound to play when the secret is revealed is something pleasant that they, uh, they get. And it kind of gives them an idea that something has happened in the maze. This is optional. They don't have to have this, but it's uh, kind of a neat little addition. It's really, when I did the video on secrets, uh, first of all, the secret behavior didn't exist. So thank you, Necrom, for making that. And that really helps a lot. Uh, but then beyond that, you know, I wanted to introduce or talk about the concept of secrets, but I didn't really have a like a plan for them so much and the secret in this level really isn't totally necessary so um, in the future if i were to make a game i would make secrets a lot more important let's get to easily my favorite change of this entire <laughs> experience and that is the carry object behavior so carry object behavior initially would make any object that fit the criteria variable you could pick it up and you could throw it um, but that was not immediately obvious to the players so not only was there not enough evidence or understanding that this was the case since this is the first time you encounter an object that is carryable uh, but also the battery output was at the bottom this is something i probably should have mentioned earlier but the battery output was at the bottom and it was covering up the text for the carry object behavior or any other behavior for that matter and so it was made it difficult to read so even if you did discover that an object was something you could pick up you couldn't read it anyway so you couldn't figure out how to control it and so the behavior has been updated to include an image now i made a little image here um, to, that kind of gives you the impression that it can be picked up. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of this cause there is a video on this one, but I'll show you the changes that were made. So really, uh, right here, you can select rearm weapons. So if you carry, so you pick up something, you had a weapon, you pick something else up, the weapon goes away. This would just automatically re-equip the weapon once you've, uh, discarded the item, uh, throw damage. That would cause damage to whatever it is you you've thrown it to uh, like a, a character for for example the diagnostic checkbox you can ignore if you have that ticked you'll see some text on the left hand side and that'll just tell you what's going on with the object sometimes it could be helpful if you're trying to uh, play test and figure things out but just leave that unticked uh, the item outline I think depending on the item could be helpful. I chose to use the item outline in this case, because I figured, you know, any, any benefit was a good benefit, but it didn't come out all that noticeable on the brick. Maybe it would be different on some other object. And you have the uh, use pickup icon, which is what this is here. We definitely want that tick. Let me show you this because it's so much better. I'm so thankful to Necrom for his changes to this. Okay, so here's our bricks, there's our icon, and our text is at the bottom. Uh, now, if we were actually playing the game, our flashlight, well, here I can show you. If the flashlight's on, the battery, it moved the battery uh, stuff up at the top, so now you can actually read the darn text. Uh, oops, I just threw that brick in the, uh, so that's the idea, you'd be able to throw the brick. Um, but so much better. Um, and so much more clear and just to make sure it's doubly clear not only did i add the hint text to the loading screen leading into this level but i also added a little text zone here just to make sure loose bricks can be picked up and even thrown so again i don't know what else i could do for the player to let them know if they're just not paying attention that's on them at this point i've done everything i could to help them understand and the only other thing on this level is a bug that I cannot do anything about. I'll have to send it over to Lee and see if he can help us with this. It may not impact you. If you're building this game along with me and you're doing what I do and it doesn't occur to you, like it doesn't happen to you. Great. Wonderful. Carry on. Um, but for me, what was happening is, and during play testing, when you come through this door, if you'll recall, then you would step into this trigger and that would cause the, uh, the keeper to appear and you'd be able to see him in your flashlight. He walks off and the next thing you know, you've got arrows 
flying at you and you've got to kind of avoid them by ducking into these little turnouts here. Um, that works perfectly in, in the test level. And for whatever reason in the actual standalone, when you build it, it doesn't work at all. You can, you can hear the arrow trap being triggered even on the other side of this wall, but no arrow actually gets fired. And I've explored this with Necrom and we've tinkered around with it. I've tried changing out the behavior. I've tried everything I could possibly think of, and it just will not fire on this level. So it is not the behavior's fault. It's something that is inherent with the level itself. Like I said, it could be a one-off. It could be something that will never happen, you know, in a million years to anybody else but me. But in my case, you know, it, it's something that I can't control for and I can't fix. So the solution to this is I'm going to send it off to Lee with a very detailed explanation. I'm going to give him the uh, standalone game. I'm going to give him the levels and uh, and just see if he can work it out. I'm going to be very patient and I'm not going to expect that he can fix it. I'm just going to wait and hopefully he can fix it. But let's assume we can't uh then what i'm going to do is come up with something else right i'll figure something else out but the important takeaway from this is twofold one problems are going to happen okay with anything it doesn't matter if you're using unity or unreal or whatever you know it's not max inherently it's game development it's development of any kind there's always going to be issues that crop up and you're going to have to deal with them and how you deal with them you know varies depending on the use case but when that happens you don't throw your hands up you don't you know go gripe in a forum you just toughen up and figure it out and so that's what we're going to do i'm going to try to reach out for some help i'm going to keep my fingers crossed but if uh, it can't be solved then i'll just come up with a different trap not the end of the world, right? When it happens, it can happen to anybody. So just understand that. Um, but that is an issue, an ongoing issue. There's some other bugs that I'll talk about also um, that will all get sent off to Lee at some point. And uh, some things really need to be fixed. Some this, this one here is one of those things that it's very specific to my game. So I don't know that there's really much that can be done. Um, but that's it. For all right. So on this level, uh, once again, changed all the sounds on all the sliders. In this case, there's twice as many sliders. So I, I really needed to dial it back. Not only is the sound softer, but there's far fewer. Uh, and that made a lot of difference. I also made the sound that I'm using a mono sound. And the reason for that is a mono sound is 3D meaning as you move away from the sound, it gets quieter. That's what you want. So if you're using a stereo sound, it's going to follow you everywhere you go throughout the level and you'll always hear it. Maybe that's what you want. Maybe it's not, but if that's not what you want, make sure it's a mono sound. Easiest way I found to do that was just download audacity, which is free. You can pull the sound in, change it. It's very simple. If you don't know how, just Google it. It's not that hard. Make it a mono sound. It'll it'll save you a lot of <laughs> a lot of grief with uh, sounds that are playing throughout the maze that that you shouldn't uh, hear. Uh, then I discovered that I needed to lower this area here. So in the original uh, build, this was all the same level raised up 100 units away from the ground level, and I was using. Uh, the final scene has a flood mechanic that floods the rooms one last challenge to overcome. But the problem with that is the water plane was directly underneath the floor so that it wouldn't take forever for the water to appear. That means that it was starting at a hundred units or just under a hundred units, maybe like 98 or whatever. But what would happen is this area here would, would be flooded um, when you started the game. And so with this, level and so as you got here and you were trying to get across this pit of spikes was flooded maybe that's not a big deal maybe that doesn't bother you it bothered me so i was like okay what am i going to do about this so what i did was i redesigned it so this is another one of those situations where 
you, know, you, you start out with an idea, you try it out and through playtesting, you realize, oh, this doesn't work the way I wanted it to. And so what you do is you redesign it and you make it better. So what I did was I lowered this portion, this room down to the ground plane and noticed that I put a little uh, pond out here in the play area so that I could see exactly where the water was starting. And so that, that way, when the water raises through the floor, um, it doesn't take forever for it to get there, nor does it flood the rest of the level. Um, so in order to do that, I had to lower this down. And so I had to be able to say, okay, well, how is the player going to get down there? Right. Um, and, and by the way, this was Necrom's idea to lower the, the level down. So thank you for the feedback and the suggestion that really helped. Um, I think I want to, I'm on the fence with this battery. I'm not sure if I want to get rid of it or not. I'm just getting distracted though. So what I did was I added these boxes here to kind of disguise this portion, this wall. So if the player comes through this area here, they come across these boxes. Now it should be evident when they cursor at the boxes that they're, you know, something that they can pick up and move. Um, and they, and they can, they can move these out of the way and that reveals this button. When they click this button, these panels uh, slide out of the way and there's a set of stairs that goes down. So they, they realize immediately, oh, this is like a little secret area here, right? They come through here and they open this door, which triggers all of the last uh, bits that we've seen before. They get frozen in this spot. The keeper laughs at them, walks into the, the uh, elevator and vanishes. Okay, they have to you have to freeze them, otherwise they could just run straight into the elevator with them. You don't want them, they don't you don't want them to do that. <laughs> um, so lo lowering this down really helped, really made it uh, work well. Uh, and then we had some issues where I discovered that an object under the water plane you can't pick it up, and, and that's not something that Necrom can help or solve or anything. It's just Something about the water uh, obscures the object such that you don't get the prompt text because the cursor just doesn't penetrate the water and see it. And so what we've done here is we've added the valve, by the way, is under these boxes. It's just a little valve wheel. And so I just made it uh, something that you could pick up automatically. So when you get close enough to it, it just you just get it and you get a prompt text that tells you that you've gotten it. Uh, but then beyond that, if you'll recall, I have some... Uh, the code scratched into the wall. Now I made it really kind of gray and, and, you know, you could see it, but you had to look, uh, but it was just being overlooked entirely. You couldn't see the darn thing with that flashlight. Um, and you weren't even aware that you were supposed to be look for and you're looking for it to begin with. And so I added a little text prompt here, just saying, you know, something is scratched on the wall. Um, so they do have to look for it. I made it a lot more visible by just kind of coloring it black. So all I do is I just changed the base color and it made it pop a little bit better. That helps. Then Necron was kind enough to change the behavior for pipe valve so that you're able to uh, press E to use it. Seems like a small thing, and it seems almost like you, you, you would expect that to have been there, but it wasn't. And so what was happening is the water plane got above the part uh, of the, the wheel that got attached. And once again, you weren't able to get a hold of it. And so that's been fixed. Now, weirdly enough, there is a bug on this level that I'll also have to report. And it's truly the most ironic bug I've ever seen. So if you'll recall on the last level, you could hear the arrow trap firing, but there was no arrow. It would not fire the stupid arrow. In this case, it's quite the opposite. For whatever reason, for the longest time, by the way, the, this was working beautifully. No issues at all. The arrows were firing. You could hear them, no problem. But for whatever reason, suddenly the sound stopped. So you can see the arrows, the arrows fire, they hurt you, they work, but you can't hear them. And I have tried and tried and tried and I cannot fix it. So that'll get bundled into the bug reports that I send off to Lee and hopefully Lee can fix that as well. Not something that's wrong with the behavior. I've already talked to Necrom. We've tested it. We've you know worked on it. It's just an oddity that happened and we'll work it out. Uh, I'll show you one other thing that's really not level related, 
but is a bug that I dis well, I didn't even discover it. Uh, one of the play testers did. If you'll recall on the storyboard, we can click on this button here, edit game settings. And here you can select an icon. So I created a little icon, nothing fancy, just the letters, right? Just something custom for the EXE. But what I discovered is that does not seem to come out when you do the standalone. As you can see here in the demo, TKL uh, demo, the icon for the EXE is just kind of a default Game Guru Max icon. Um, I don't know why, it just doesn't seem to, you know, transfer over. So that'll just be something that I report. But that's really more all games. That's something that really needs to be fixed. That's not like something unique to my game. That's, uh, at least I don't think so. I'd be interested to know if you're not having that problem, but I'm assuming everybody's having that problem. So we'll get that reported if it's not already reported. Might already be reported and I'll just include my thoughts on it. And lastly, I wanted to talk about some of the lessons learned. And this is something that I've done in my professional career for years and years. So after every project, um, I like to reflect back on what went well, what could have been better, what really just failed and think about the lessons learned because there's always something to learn. Right. So uh, for this particular project, it should be no different. I'd like to instill this um, practice in you as well, because it's very important. Uh, so when I think back about all the things that we've covered in the series and also from the playtesting, one of the first things that stand out to me was the initial playtest that I got back uh, was uh, it could have been better. It really could have been better. I was a little sloppy in some areas. And uh, the result was frustration, right? The player uh, really just didn't have a good experience. And that's never, uh, a, you know, never what we want from our games, right? We were trying to uh, create something that's fun and enjoyable. And I failed miserably at that. And so I'm sorry for that. I went back and fixed as much as I could. Some of the best feedback came from that video, though, because um you know there were very valid points made and so uh took all of that to heart made those adjustments and it was clear uh through the, in the second video from that play tester that things were much better the other thing i learned and this is kind of a positive is the play test videos were invaluable they were so fantastic um they were great length uh, they they were very detailed and extremely helpful so i can uh, you know i can tell you i don't get you know videos like that at work i have to uh just rely on verbal feedback or written feedback most of the time sometimes i get the chance to watch somebody uh work with the the tools that i develop but most of the time i don't get that so having that video was awesome and i would encourage you when you're making your game and you're getting it play tested uh, that you ask them to record their sessions uh, in, in, in their entirety. No edits, leave it all in because you never know what they might miss that you'll pick up. So when you're watching those, you'll get their feedback, you'll get their uh, thoughts and opinions and, and so forth, which is great. But then also you'll see things that they don't see because you're close enough that you'll know, oh, that didn't actually work the way I expected it. So all of that was super valuable, could not... Uh, could not think of enough for doing all that uh, that work playtesting for me. Now, one thing that I did observe is that I only got two videos back. I asked five individuals to playtest, or six. I don't remember, it may have been six. Got two back. Um, now, one of those people was my wife, and she just doesn't have a way to record. And that's, that was fine. She wasn't going to record anything for me. And I got, you know, I understood that. So, got a lot of feedback anyways from her, just talking to her. And, uh, you know, she's not really a first person perspective kind of player, kind of makes her sick. And so that's, you know, not for everybody. It's okay. But I still got some good feedback from her as well. But the videos were amazing. Um, so if you're going to ask for videos uh, or even have, you know, ask for playtesters, I would encourage you to uh, ask more people than you would initially think right so if if i got two out of let's say it was two out of five then maybe i should have asked 10 or maybe i should have asked 20 i don't know what you know whatever i wanted back 
Uh, the two were good, the two were helpful, the two were enough, but it would have been even better to have more. Players will always do things that are unexpected or unintended. Um, that's just the nature of people. Doesn't matter if you're you're you know creating a process or a form or a website or you know an application or product or game. It, it doesn't matter what you're developing. Play, people are people, and they're going to do what people do, which is break stuff and and find ways to do things differently, um, and so and misinterpret what you intended. That happens all the time. So. In development, uh, what we do is we think about those things very carefully and we try to explore all of the paths that are conceivable. You're not going to think of every possible thing. It's just impossible to, to do that. But uh, you can pretty well conceive of, well, what if they don't do that? What if they what if they jump over the pit instead of picking up the brick and throwing it? You know, things like that. Maybe it's okay. Maybe it's not. You know, but you got to think that through carefully. I already kind of knew this, but I wanted to include it in the lessons learned anyways, because if you're not already aware of that, you really do have to think about all the different scenarios. It's something that um, in my professional life, not everybody thinks through. They think about the happy path, right? The way it's supposed to go. And that's fine because that's the, you know, that's the process essentially, but it's not how it's going to work mo you know not all the time there's going to be times when it, when it doesn't work that way and when it doesn't you got to account for it bear that in mind um, and then the game design document would have been extremely helpful in this scenario however i made a decision early on that i wasn't going to do a game design document that i was going to leave it to chance and I was going to solicit uh, ideas and, and feedback and suggestions from the viewers, which I got, right? I, it wasn't like I didn't get anything, but I would have liked to have had more um, participation, but I didn't get it. And that's okay. That's something that, you know, I was anticipating might happen. And so uh, some of these things, like I look at, I look at level one, for example, right? Which is the, the level after the tutorial. And I think how boring that level is. And I think, man, if I had to do over again, I would just throw that level out and redesign it. But I'm not going to do that because we've already recorded the series and it's already been done. And that could have been avoided. We could have, uh, you know, play tested it more and come up with uh, a better progression in terms of difficulty and so forth. All that could have been planned ahead of time. That's what the game design document is for. But I didn't have one. And the absence of that was severely missed. So uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, game design document, click this link and it will help you understand what it is a game design, design document is and, and how it works and how to use one. Um, it may just seem like a, you know, a unnecessary step, but I can assure you it's not. Um, but that's, that's it. That's the entire series all wrapped up. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something from it. I certainly did. I'm going to click the like button down below. I hope you do too. Um, if you're new here, and if you just haven't subscribed yet, we'd love to have you stick around. It's kind of a weird spot to start, but um, be sure to, to play back the series from the beginning and, and take, what, take from it what you will. And then lastly, if you'd like a notification for whenever new videos are posted, just click the bell icon and that'll let you know when a new video is ready. Thanks so much for watching all the way through. I hope you enjoyed the entire series. And uh, thank you for taking this, this journey with me. I, I really appreciate it. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now. Hey, don't forget there's a written guide for every behavior, including ones I haven't yet uh, covered on this channel. And if you want to learn some more, why don't you check out this video next?